Yeah, spell my name wrong. Hello, everybody that's uh, joined so far. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're going to wait till maybe about 101 to kick off the presentation as folks trickle in here. So um, we'll get started shortly. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the second installment of the PNCWA uh, Continuing Education Series, where it's an opportunity to uh, earn CEUs and connect with uh, vendor manufacturers in the water and wastewater industry. Really appreciate everybody registering and being here today. Um, so quick note, in order to earn CEUs for this presentation, you must be in attendance for the full hour. So we have moderators that are reviewing um, and watching the attendee list. And um, you must be here from the beginning to the end of the full hour to re receive the CEU. Uh, a second note, uh, we are still waiting for some documentation for CEUs and we will follow up after this presentation once that documentation is available, but uh, rest assured we will follow up with the proper CEU documentation so you can get credit uh, for attending this course. Um, so now I'll move on to introducing our speaker today. We've got Gunnar Thorderson. Uh, he is the executive vice president and founder of PSI Water Technologies. Um, Gunnar co-founded the chemical services company in 1998, uh, providing alternative disinfection technologies in response to toxic gas ordinances adopted in California communities. Gunnar was also the co-founder and president of Clortec, building the company from a small operation to a dominant on-site sodium hypochlorite generator manufacturer. In 1998, Gunnar and his, and his business partner sold Clortech to Severn Trent Services, and Gunnar took over as the vice president of the water purification division. In 2003, Gunnar co-found Process Solutions Incorporated, now PSI Water Technologies, a technology company providing disinfection solutions. PSI Water Technologies developed the patented microchlor on-site hypochlorite, excuse me, hypochlorite generation system as well as the Tank Shark Reservoir Mixing System. Gunnar attended the University of California, Davis, and has a degree in economics. And with that, I will pass the presentation to Gunnar. Thanks for being here today. Thanks very much, Casey. Let me uh, share my screen and we'll get started. All right, okay. looks good, Gunnar. So it looks good. Okay, yep. thank you, Casey, very much. Um, really excited to be able to present to you folks today. Uh, usually, we always do these in person, but uh, we have to make do with this. And um, I just want to expand a little bit on Casey's introduction. Um, Brent Simmons and I got started in electrochlorination back in 1988. 
as a response to the tax and gas ordinance, um, which was first adopted in Santa Clara County, California, which later became Article 80 the Uniform Fire Code and triggered the EPA to require the risk management planning if you were going to continue to use chlorine gas. So um, in 1988, we started with a very crude electrolytic uh, system. And then in the mid 90s, we developed the Chlortec unit, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. I know there were, there were a lot of Chlortec installations throughout the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. And <clears throat> we eventually had thousands of installations across the United States. And that got the interest of some of the larger players in the water market. And uh, we were approached by Seven Trent Services. And uh, to be quite honest with you, you know, being young, starving entrepreneurs that looked really attractive to us. So uh, we uh, agreed to sell uh, the company and the Clortech technology to Severn Trent and that acquisition closed in November of 1999. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with every acquisition of a business, there's an employment contract and a non-compete contract. We had a two-year employment contract and a five-year non-compete contract. And uh, at the end of the second year of the employment contract, they asked us to stay for a third year and we agreed to do so. Um, but at this time, the Clortech, our design, started to show weaknesses um, that we wanted to engineer solutions to, but Severn Trent wasn't interested in, in spending the money and resources to do that. So uh, Brent and I left Severn Trent in April of 2003 and started uh, PSI, it, it, we left in March of 2003 and started PSI in April of 2003. And at that time, we still had two years left on our um, non-compete contract, which actually turned out to be a blessing because you know it, it's very common manufacturers have to modify an existing product to solve a problem. But we had the luxury of being completely out of the market and really evaluating what's good, bad, good and bad about on-site generation. Because conceptually, why isn't everybody producing their disinfectant on-site as they need it? Eliminating the, the transportation, handling and storage of a hazardous material. Well, the pushback has always been the technology is too complicated. It's not reliable. It's not safe. Um, we, it's too difficult to maintain and it's not cost effective. So uh, we really focused on, on eliminating that pushback and because manufacturing your disinfectant on site is not complicated because all we're dealing with here is simply salt, water, and electricity to produce your disinfectant on site. Sodium chloride, H2O and power, nets you your sodium hypochlorite and H2 hydrogen gas is your byproduct. Now all chlorine, whether it's gaseous, liquid, or solid form is made from salt. So this is not a, a foreign process. This has been around for a long, long time. So all salt is made, all chlorine is made from salt regardless of, of its packaging, whether it's packaged in gaseous form, liquid form, or solid form. So uh, we wanna just show you that on-site generation is a very safe and simple way to, to disinfect but hydrogen is the byproduct of all chlorine production and hydrogen has to be managed properly. Um, so we really focused on hydrogen management in this process. So the evolution, in the mid nineties, you see the Chlortec system that we developed and on the right, the microchlor, but the significant differences in these two technologies that are available today is that the um, Chlortec and others are what we call horizontal electrolyzers. And that's simply the electrolyzer as you can see is a horizontal tube and uh, it's a single pass electrolyzer, meaning your electrolyte, your brine, enters the left end of the horizontal housing and travels through each compartment until it exits the far end. So it's a single pass. The vertical cell technology um, is a multi-cell configuration and it strips the hydrogen waste product from each cell. It does not contain the hydrogen as it travels from one cell to the next. So those are the two major differences in 
the OSG systems available in the marketplace today, horizontal electrolyzer versus a uh, vertical electrolyzer. And you can see there, the systems are all skid mounted. There are three major components to an on-site system. Here in the bottom left is the rectifier that does your AC power, DC power rectification. Above that, your PLC controls with HMI and your electrolytic cells all on a stainless steel skid. So in 2017, AWWA issued a survey and 37% of the respondents in 2017, I'm sure it's increased from that, um, reported that they have moved away from gaseous chlorine and are using either bulk sodium hypochlorite or on-site generated sodium hypochlorite. And a good reference manual, yeah, this was published by AWWA, the M65 manual. It's a good reference book um, that gives you the history of on-site generation, uh, and the chemistry, and also design considerations, because that's very important. If you are going to um, look into on-site generation, um, the different manufacturers have very different mechanical and electrical design considerations. So that's important to, to understand that before you move forward. And also the risks and trade-offs of on-site generation, because you are dealing with hydrogen as, as a byproduct. Uh, they also included several good case studies um, and an economic review. And we'll, we'll drill down a little bit into an economic review of on-site generation versus uh, commercial bleach. So chlorine gas has been used very successfully for, for many, many decades and has a, has a relatively good safety record. Um, you know, I follow chlorine accidents and, and you'd be surprised how many accidents are not from chlorine gas, but rather from uh, commercial uh, bleach. So if you're looking to get rid of your chlorine gas system, you really have two alternatives. You, you can purchase commercial strength sodium hypochlorite and it's delivered to you in 12 and a half to 15% concentration. And at that concentration, it's still classified as a hazardous material. Uh, special training, handling, and placarding required. And at that concentration, it also degrades. It doesn't, chlorine does not want to be a liquid. So that degradation has, has a couple of problems with it. What it means is your cost per pound of free available chlorine is increasing as you inventory that material. And it also forms disinfection byproducts. You form chlorates and perchlorates. And this is why AWWA has published a recommendation that if you are gonna use high strength sodium hypochlorite that you dilute it to 6% 6 or less to stop that degradation or at least slow it down and also the, the disinfection byproduct formation. So what that means in, in your design is your tank farm now is twice the size and you have to include a softening station because you have to dilute sodium hypochlorite with soft water. Otherwise you end up with a scaling nightmare. So uh, also pumping high strength sodium hypochlorite is problematic because it's very common to get vapor locking of dosing pumps. It also uh, has a pH of 13. So it uh, has very high scaling tendencies, scaling of your chemical feed lines, as well as your injectors. Um, but the, it's attractive because it has a relatively low capital cost. You're investing in pumps and tanks but it has a very high operating cost. Your cost per pound of free available chlorine is very high. Typically when compared to chlorine gas, it can be as high as four times the cost per pound. So uh, on-site generation is becoming very popular. I know there, there are quite a few on-site generation systems throughout the Pacific Northwest um, producing 0.8% sodium hypochlorite. You know, I'm quite often told by operators that, hey, that's too weak. We can't use it in our application. Well, that's not true because 0.8% concentration is 8,000 parts per million. And uh, most water wastewater applications are dosing in single digits. So the solution is pre pre plenty strong, excuse me, for any water wastewater application. And at the 0.8% concentration, it is not classified as a hazardous material. So there's no special placarding, handling, or training required. And it has a 
pH of nine. So it's a significantly friendlier solution than high strength sodium hypochlorite. And at that concentration of 0.8, it also does not degrade. So your cost per pound of free available chlorine is going to be constant. And simplified pumping, we don't have the vapor locking of like the high strength sodium hypochlorite, but it does have a higher capital cost, significantly higher capital cost, but a reduced operating cost. So when compared to commercial bleach, there is an ROI, a return on investment using on-site generation. The, depending on the size of the system, your payback can be as, as fast as uh, three years. I have a very unique situation in, uh, in Hawaii because of the high cost of chemical that has to be brought over to Hawaii by barge. They're seeing a return on their investment as quickly as 18 months, even with their higher capital, excuse me, higher power costs of, at 35 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so on-site generation, I consider it to be an asset. You're investing in a piece of capital equipment that uh, solves a problem. You're eliminating your hazardous chemicals or hazardous chlorine products from your facility, and it will pay for itself over time when compared to bulk bleach. And all you're bringing to the facility is simply salt, water, and electricity. And, uh, you know, I, I quite often when I give these presentations, uh, you know, warn about pandemics. Well, here we are living one. And uh, there's always that concern that that delivery truck may not show up. The driver didn't show up for work. He's sick. Everybody's uh, shorthanded uh, for any number of reasons. Um, but with on-site generation, you can, uh, you can store large quantities of salt because it's, it's non-hazardous, does not have a shelf life and it's inexpensive. And your facilities, I'm sure, already have backup power and you have water. So now you have all the ingredients to produce your disinfectant on site as you need it, regardless of what's happening outside the fence. It's all about that resiliency that our industry is, is all a buzz about these days. And also uh, frequency of delivery. Uh, one truckload of salt is equal to three truckloads of high strength sodium hypochlorite because what's most of that truck full of? Water that you're buying from somebody else. So it's a three to one on uh, frequency of delivery. Uh, this is just an example of the degradation curve for sodium hypochlorite at 12 and percent. You can see the, uh, the higher the temperature, the steeper the degradation curve. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, some utilities, uh, not very many in my travels, are doing the dilution. Uh, some utilities have gone to the expense of uh, housing their hypochlorite storage and temperature controlling the room uh, to slow down that degradation and formation of, of uh, disinfection byproducts. Another alternative is to take smaller loads. Uh, and so the inventory time on, on the hypo is is shorter, but that's a uh, temperature controlling your sodium hypochlorite is, is a costly endeavor as well, especially in summertime. But if we look at uh, just a, a very brief economic model, nationally, I, I see uh, hypochlorite at 80 cents per gallon. You're not buying it by the pound of free available chlorine, you're buying it by the gallon. So you have to factor in that uh, degradation into any economic analysis but you can uh, buy salt cheap, power cheap, and produce your disinfectant for significantly less than you can buy it for. And again, frequency of delivery. You've got the hypochlorite being delivered as a hazardous material. Uh, one truckload of salt is equal to three truckloads of that high strength sodium hypochlorite. So the pushback, the reason why a lot of people aren't using on-site generation is, is for for these areas that we focused on and engineered solutions to is number one is safety and hydrogen management. Um, we really wanted to take a look at the hydrogen and how that's being managed. Uh, and the technology doesn't need to be complicated because again, you're only dealing with salt water and electricity. Um, and serviceability is, 
is a is a big factor. Uh, once you invest in on-site generation, you want to make sure that your staff can service and maintain the equipment. And reliability is is very important as well. But the bottom line is this technology has to be cost, cost effective. So all OSG systems use the same raw materials. Um, you're gonna consume two kilowatt hours of electricity, 15 gallons of water and three pounds of salt to produce one pound of free available chlorine in the form of 15 gallons of 0.8% sodium hypochlorite. And your waste product hydrogen for every pound of of chlorine produced, you're going to release 1 35th of a pound of hydrogen safely to atmosphere. And I, I should mention that that 15 gallons of water in a water application is not uh, a cost factor because it goes right back into the system in the form of the hypochlorite. So as mentioned, there are two type of electrolytic cells on the market. The horizontal electrolyzers, we developed this uh, electrolytic cell in the mid 90s. Uh, still available today, uh, currently being marketed under the name of Denora. And um, what we learned with this horizontal cell is that uh, over time, there are some issues that, that, that pop up. Um, these baffles that you see here are required because of the horizontal housing. You need to control the flow of the electrolyte between the electrodes so to avoid short circuiting of the electrolyte along the top of the horizontal housing. Also, uh, we needed internal fasteners and spacers to hold all the electrodes in place. Well, we learned that the, uh, the environment inside of the electrolytic cell is, is very hostile. You have 8,000 parts per million of chlorine, you have heat, and you have other oxi oxidizers present. So um, we learned over time that these plastic materials would um, deteriorate, become brittle and or break. And a horizontal electrolyzer cannot be completely drained uh, and cleaning is required. So periodically the operator needs to extract the electrode assembly out of the housing for cleaning, which uh, is a, you know, additional maintenance. And, uh, in the bottom left, you can see a horizontal electrolyzer in operation. And remember I said it's a single pass. So your brine's going in the far left side and traveling from one compartment to the next where you're gaining hypochlorite concentration, but you're also increasing the volume of hydrogen in each of those compartments. So your, your waste product is being contained in, in, the, in the cell and uh, actually interfering with the electrolytic process because that gas is blinding your electrode surfaces. So it took us a while to figure this out, but hydrogen you know, doesn't really want to travel left to right, does it? So the vertical cell solves that problem. The vertical cell allows for that hydrogen to escape the process immediately and not travel from one cell compartment to the next. The vertical cell also has eliminated all of the internal hardware and there are no baffles in a vertical cell. Um, also the, the, the fasteners you can see here are on the dry side of an O-ring seal. So the only thing in that hostile environment of the cell are the electrodes themselves. And all of the fasteners are titanium. So they will not corrode over time. And if you compare the operation on the left of a horizontal cell with the operation of a vertical cell on the right, you can see that gas is not being contained in the vertical cell. There are tiny little micro bubbles that travel vertically through the cell and vent to atmosphere. So this is what the uh, OSG system looks like. All OSG systems require the same ancillary equipment and um, what's unique to the microchlor is what's in the orange box, but we'll start at the left. We need uh, potable water, and it's very important to soften that water. Hardness is the enemy of any on-site generation system. It dramatically increases the maintenance and the cleaning cycles um, for the unit. 
Then we use that soft water to dissolve our salt. Salt quality is also very important. You wanna use the best salt you can because that will minimize your maintenance dramatically. Uh, I have a lot of customers on the East Coast. Maybe you guys, since all the snow you've been getting up there, um, if they could use road salt and absolutely not. Um, that is not a good, good salt to use. But in your brine tank, we always wanna have more dry salt than we have liquid in our storage tank because that assures us that we have a fully saturated brine solution. So we know what that salt concentration is. Then we dilute that saturated brine solution 10 to one with additional soft water. And that dilute brine solution goes to the first, first cell where you are electrolyzing, you're disassociating that sodium chloride into sodium hypochlorite and releasing H2 hydrogen. And you can see in a vertical cell that hydrogen has an immediate passive exit from the process. And the, the electrolytic cells are hydraulically in series, similar to what you saw in a horizontal cell with each of the baffled compartments. But um, the cells are hydraulically in series, gaining hypochlorite concentration, but the hydrogen venting is in parallel off of each cell. And then your finished product goes to your hypochlorite storage tank. All OSG systems are what we call batch systems. And what that means is the PLC is monitoring, excuse me, your hypochlorite level in your storage tank. And as you draw the hypochlorite down to the low set point, the PLC will recognize that. And before it starts to generate hypochlorite, there are several safety interlocks that have to be confirmed before we start generating. We have to confirm that the hydrogen dilution blower is operational. We have to, I don't know why this wants to self advance. Um, hydrogen dilution blower is operational. We want to confirm we have air pressure in the hypochlorite storage tank, not releasing any, any gas into the room, and that we want to confirm that we've got air flow at the vent because the hydrogen concentration at the vent is less than 25% of the LEL, the lower explosion limit. Uh, so that con hydrogen concentration is less than 1% at the vent. Once those safety interlocks are confirmed, the generation process will, uh, will begin. And the generator will run until the high set point in the hypochlorite storage tank is reached. Uh, the generator will turn off. The dilution blower will run for five minutes, purging any gases. And then everything simply is in standby until you draw that tank down again. And then the re process repeats itself. Pretty simple. Uh, this is a vertical cell uh, in operation. You can see that the micro bubbles and the velocity at which they're traveling vertically through the cell compared to a, a horizontal cell. And the vertical cells since they don't have the baffles are open to atmosphere. That gas is never contained in the system. And since it's open to atmosphere, those little micro bubbles are allowed to expand into larger bubbles. And then we get foam and we get complete liquid gas separation to a common header for a single roof penetration um, for the venting. Uh, as I mentioned, there, uh, this is, uh, uh, Eugene, uh, they have f three 500 pound per day uh, generators at their facility. Just to rattle off, you know, a few other users of on site generation in the Pacific Northwest. We've got Newburgh, uh, Vancouver, Clark County, and, uh, and Eugene. This is a picture of their, their facility. And I think this has been in operation, I want to say, a couple years already. Uh, this is another example of a 50 MGD surface water treatment plant owned by uh, Missouri American Water. This was commissioned in 2007 and uh, it's still in operation today. Uh, the reason I include this slide is to, is to show the, that even at 1200 pounds per day, the footprint of the generator is pretty small. And the reason they have three is they've got uh, a one generator will satisfy their winter chlorine demand. Two together will satisfy their 
peak chlorine demand, and a third they have as uh, standby. So um, moving now to the rectifier, <laughs> the other major component of an OSG system is that it's very important to maintain constant current or constant amperage in the electrolytic cells. And the conditions in the cell is always changing. Um, incoming water temperature changes seasonally. Brine density changes with temperature and scale adds electrical resistance. So all of the OSG systems have to compensate for those changes in operating conditions. So um, many of the systems out there use what's called a constant current rectifier. It outputs the specified current or amperage and manipulates the voltage up or down to compensate for those operating conditions. Um, the microchlor uses brine conductivity to control the amperage in the cell. The PLC monitors the amperage set point, and then we simply add more salt or less salt to control that amperage set point. Because we know that the more salt you put in solution, the more conductive it is. It's easier to pass current. So if the PLCs that amperage drop off ever so slightly, we have this positive displacement gear pump with speed control as our brine pump. So the PLC simply speeds up that brine pump, adding more salt, raising the conductivity, therefore raising the amperage set point. So by modulating the brine feed, we can control the amperage set point in the cells, which allows us to now use a fixed voltage rectifier on the right, so we're not asking the rectifier to manipulate the voltage like the rectifier on the left. Um, that is a fixed uh, current rectifier that manipulates the voltage based on operating conditions in the cell. The microchlor is controlling that set point by brine conductivity and can now use a fixed voltage, very efficient 99% power factor rectifier, greatly simplified and very robust and very efficient. Um, the multi-cell configuration also has a benefit that if you do have an issue with one of the cells, because all your cells are, your, are not in one basket, it's very easy to remove a cell and replace it with a pipe spool and continue to produce your sodium hypochlorite. And this video shows you how simple it is. The process is to turn the generator off, drain the contents, and the vertical cells don't have baffles so they can be completely drained. Remove your DC cables, pop the cell out, pop in a pipe spool, and the operator will reduce the water flow by 20% because you don't wanna dilute your concentration but you are sacrificing 20% of your chlorine production. Jumper your DC power cables together and you're operational at reduced capacity, but you're still making hypo. And when sizing an onset generation system, we recommend that you size it at a 75% duty cycle for two reasons. You don't wanna run these generators 24 seven and if you do need to take a cell out of service, you still meet your chlorine demand. Um, acid cleaning, uh, all OSG systems will need to be chemically cleaned periodically. Again, that's a function of runtime, salt quality and water quality. So the better your water quality, the better your salt quality, the fewer cleanings you're gonna need to do. Uh, they're, depending on the size of generation system, there, there are different types of, of cleaning systems available, but it's a pretty simple process. Um, you're going to fill the tank three quarters full with water, add your muriatic acid, swimming pool acid to the tank. You're gonna turn the generator off. You can see on the, on the cells, you can see some white. That's, that's the scale buildup. 
So you can turn the generator off, drain the contents, do a rinse cycle, removing any residual hypochlorite in the, in the system. And then you're going to connect the hose bottom left to the drain port on the generator, pumping the dilute acid solution into the cells, flooding the cells, and then let it sit for 45 minutes to an hour, go do something else, come back, the scale will be gone. You reverse the pump on the cart, bringing the spent acid back in to the cart for proper disposal. You do a rinse cycle and you're back up, up and running again. With good salt, good water, this is typically twice, maybe three times per year. And on smaller systems can take an hour, on larger systems can take two hours. Again, you're only taking, doing it a couple times a year. The difference between the horizontal cell and the vertical cell is again, because of the baffling, the, uh, the acid solution needs to be circulated through the cell, not just sit in, a, in an acid bath. Uh, salt handling uh, for smaller systems, salt is purchased in uh, 50 pound bags by the pallet. It's available from Lowe's, Home Depot, readily available everywhere. And the salt is added manually to a polyethylene tank. Um, as you draw brine out, you need makeup water. So there's automatic level controls on the left of the tank that as you draw brine out, it's replaced with additional soft water to dissolve additional salt. Uh, larger systems, you buy salt in bulk. They come in 20 to 25 ton quantities, depending on the state. Uh, the driver hooks up his hose and blows the salt into the tank. And that, uh, that FRP tank is your salt storage as well as your brine saturator all in one. This is the Upper Trinity plant outside of Dallas, Texas. They have three 2,000 pound per day generators in that, in that plant. Uh, and they're currently expanding the plant and are going to be adding additional generators uh, to that plant. A couple of case studies. Uh, this is San Diego, their Otai plant. I like sharing this case study uh, because it's a good example of how the, a business case uh, for on-site generation versus uh, uh, bulk hypo uh, turns out. But this is their chlorine gas building down here where they have the ton cylinders. Uh, we had to demo the gas and install the on-site generation without taking the plant out of service. So we brought in the hypochlorite storage tanks first. They were installed on this side of the building. We brought in the softening system as well as the dosing system and operated off of bulk bleach during uh, demo and construction. This is uh, San Diego's business case. Uh, they extracted some of this from their RMP. Uh, this is their uh, I call it the kill zone, but there are areas that would be impacted if they were to have a leak. You can see up to 23 miles away, they, they would have impacted the population with a chlorine leak. So um, they no longer do their RMP, uh, they're exempt. What's interesting about this case, business case here is that even with the higher capital cost of on-site generation, the net present value is nearly is half of the bulk hypochlorite, 9.94 million versus 4.97 million. So uh, the Otai plant with two, went with two 1,000 pound per day generators. They wanted 100% redundancy. So they have two 1,000 pound per, per day unit, each with a slave control panel, dedicated water softeners to each generator as well as to the brine tank. Uh, dedicated rectifier to each generator and a master control panel, duty standby hydrogen dilution blowers and three hypochlorite storage tanks. So uh, what they, not only did they gain full redundancy, but they've got excess generating capacity. So with the high power costs in California, they're able to make all of their hypo at night paying lower power rates and uh, dose 24 seven, but they're making all their hypo at night uh, with lower rates, which is saving them a fair amount of money. This is the finished product. Uh, this is the ton cylinder room. Each, each unit has five 200 pound per day cells. These are the softeners, dual tank Connecticut softeners. 
Uh, they installed a water hardness monitor. Um, I'm not a big fan. Uh, they're problematic and expensive. I'd much rather have uh, the operators get a $15 bottle of test strips and test the hardness in the water that way. Uh, we also used a bulk dilution panel. This panel um, gives them the opportunity to uh, bring in commercial bleach in the event of a uh, you know, catastrophic failure and dilute the hypochlorite down to the 0.8% concentration utilizing the, uh, the same dosing system. Uh, this is their uh, 40 ton uh, FRP brine tank, duty standby hydrogen dilution blowers. Uh, same fixed voltage rectifier, just scaled up. And uh, you can see on the right, because of its efficiency and, and reduced waste heat, the cooling requirements are very, very, very small. Uh, all OSG systems uh, are SCADA compatible. I think most of the manufacturers have standardized on the Allen Bradley Micrologix 1400, um, but uh, other platforms are supported, Modicon and, and whatever else are supported, but Ethernet, uh, SCADA compatibility is achieved through Ethernet or Modbus. Uh, this is an interesting case study in Nashville. Nashville has two 90 MGD surface water treatment plants. The KR Harrington plant was on ton cylinders and the Omohundro plant uh, had a 90 ton rail car of chlorine gas. The Omohundro plant was built in 1888 and much of, uh, much of the original equipment is still there and operational. It's an amazing uh, plant. It's, part of, it's on the uh, historical registry, but anyway, uh, 10 years ago, they had their 700 year flood and the KR Harrington plant completely flooded and the Oma Hundra plant was close. So uh, they wanted to get rid of their chlorine gas, hired a consultant, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, looked at their options. They looked at bulk hypo, uh, ruled it out because of the uh, cost increase as well as the frequency of deliveries. So uh, they wanted to look at on-site generation they did their due diligence. They uh, looked at several plants, several manufacturers, and uh, they have three 2,400 pound per day microchlor units at uh, each of their plants. Um, Olivenhain in Southern California, uh, that's Dave. Uh, I sold Dave a Clortec system in the 90s. Uh, that Clortec unit served him well, but it was at the end of life. And he also evaluated uh, bulk bleach, uh, but wanted to stay with on-site generation um, and uh, decided on the microchlor unit for the safety and serviceability Im improvements. And his experiences were uh, published in Opflow Magazine in 2014. Uh, this is an interesting case study. This is Aqua America, a uh, privately owned utility on the East Coast. This tank uh, is a 10 million gallon tank. It's 120 feet tall. And uh, they're a chloramine system. And they were having difficulty maintaining residual uh, in this tank, as well as uh, uh, keeping it from nitrifying. So uh, a pilot was, was conducted and uh, incorporated a tank mixer, a tank shark, and uh, the tank shark eliminated the temperature as well as chemical stratification in that tank. So um, they were able to uh, maintain residual, maintain that monochloramine residual in the tank. And uh, the trailer had a microchlor unit in it. And uh, the permanent installation is the bottom right where they, uh, they like the whole OSG concept and, and stayed with it. Uh, small groundwater systems. Uh, Rancho California is a 100% groundwater system and they had 150 pound chlorine gas cylinders at each of their well sites. Uh, management wanted to get rid of that risk because their well sites are simply a lot in a neighborhood. Uh, so their gas is right next to somebody's backyard. Um, but operations was not interested in making any, any changes. Uh, 
So management bought one 20 pound per day unit, which you see in the upper left. And six months later, oper the operators fell in love with it, the simplicity and reliability of it, and no longer having to deal with chlorine gas. And Rancho has been buying 10 to 12 OSG systems per year. And they're now up to 65 OSG systems throughout their distribution system. Uh, caution you, controls are a big part of these systems and uh, they can get out of control uh, without any, any real value. I said the, the standard is the micro logics. If your instrumentation guys want to go to compact logics, control logics or something else, the controls can quickly, quickly uh, cost more than the generator itself. So um, just consult with us and, and your instrumentation people, but we can do whatever, whatever you want. So uh, on-site generation is a safe alternative to chlorine gas as well as bulk sodium hypochlorite. Um, and it's easy to operate and maintain. Uh, carries a good solid warranty and uh, has become very reliable uh, and robust and significant cost savings over, over commercial bleach. So that is the end of my presentation and I would welcome questions. I encourage questions. Thank you, Gunnar. Awesome presentation. Uh, lots of solid information there. So if folks have questions, uh, please feel free to write them in the chat box. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, there is a icon labeled Q&A. So please feel free to, to type questions there and we can present them to Gunnar. Um, I have one quick one. Uh, so I noticed these systems produce um, hydrogen gas. Have you ever seen any applications where that gas is collected and used for energy? Is there any sure. additional value there? It's a great question, Casey, because um, I was hoping I would get that. Um, we have never captured the hydrogen um, for several reasons. We're not uh, experts in that field. And the volume of hydrogen coming off the generator, remember, for every pound of chlorine, you're only producing 1 35th of a pound of hydrogen. So there isn't enough of it to make it economically viable. And it's also what's called dirty hydrogen. So you'd have to scrub that hydrogen before you could use it for any type of a fuel cell. Sure, sure. You just hear about hydrogen gas and think maybe there's an opportunity there. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's, we, believe me, we've thought about it and all the consultants we work with, they think about it. And sure, sure. Uh, we have another question. Uh, any degradation of the cells over time and what would be their anticipated lifespan? Yeah, good question. Um, the electrolytic cells uh, are not the weak link of an on-site generation system. Uh, the, uh, again, it's a function of runtime and, and maintenance, but the cells are warranted uh, full replacement for three years, uh, for years four through seven. It's a prorated warranty uh, because it is a consumable part. But if the system is properly sized and properly maintained, uh, 10 years is not out of the question in terms of life expectancy. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question coming in. Do you see many wastewater plants converting or even using this technology? Yes, um, you know, depending on the wastewater plant, you know, UV is, has been used extensively because uh, the, you don't have the requirement to dechlorinate. Uh, but we have a lot of wastewater plants using on-site generation, especially if they're, they're reclaiming water and need to uh, impart a residual. Sure, absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, what are the water quality requirements for the feed water? I remember you said that it needs softening, but can you speak a little bit more about uh, what the feed water requirements are? Yeah, sure. Um, if Number one, if you classify your water as potable, we can use it. We just need to remove the hardness because the electrolytic cells themselves are the best softeners in the world. Any, any hardness in the water or in the salt will scale the electrodes. So 
Um, the water quality hardness is the main one. Um, excessive or you know high levels of manganese is a concern, um, but it in this country it hasn't been a problem. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, another question here at 0.8% concentration, do you still recommend degassing valves on chlorine piping and metering pumps? We have, yeah, best practice is you can continue to do that, but in the designs of all the systems that we've done, uh, we have not needed to incorporate degassing valves. Okay. The other thing I, I didn't mention um, since we're on this subject, uh, a lot of operators in my, in my uh, travels complain that the high strength sodium hypochlorite attacks their glue joints and uh, they develop leaks over, over time. And you know that's obviously a nuisance. Uh, but if you're installing an onsite generation system, it's very important to use a very specific PVC glue and it's uh, Weld on 724. All right, um, general question, uh, and this is maybe more for PNC to be way, but it is, will the presentations be made available? And yes, they will. Uh, we'll be posting these recorded presentations on the PNC WA Lunch and Learn website. So the same website that you went to to register for the course, um, we're gonna post the presentations there if you wanna watch it um, after the fact. Unfortunately, you need to be attending uh, in person to the live event to earn the CEU. So the recorded presentation, you won't be able to earn a CEU for that, uh, but nonetheless, the information will be available. So um, that will uh, be posted to the PNCWA website. So another question here for Gunnar, um, why not turn the horizontal OSG system into a vertical orientation to improve operation? <laughs> um. We never tried that, and um, yeah, I would direct that question to the manufacturers of the horizontal cell. All right, um, and then another question coming through: If you can speak a little bit to the smallest generator that is made, or what's the smallest yeah. generator? Yeah, um, you know, the, all the OSG manufacturers offer a wide range of of sizes. Um, microchlor smallest unit is eight pounds per day. And that again is its maximum generating capacity. So if you need five pounds, six pounds, uh, or four pounds, it's, it's applicable. Uh, microchlor's largest unit is 2,400 pounds per day, you know, multiple sizes in between. Uh, I know the Denora um, has, starts at either six pounds a day or 12 pounds a day and goes all the way up to uh, 3,000 pounds per day. So each manufacturer offers a wide range of capacities. Okay, thank you. So that was uh, the last live question we have. If anybody else has additional questions, we do have more time here. Um, please post them in the chat box. Before any more questions come through, we're gonna take a minute uh, and the PNCWA management that's helping us host these presentations will post a poll uh, to see if you are interested in having uh, your contact information shared with the presenter today, um, at least follow up and get more information on on-site hypochlorite, excuse me, excuse me on-site sodium hypochlorite generation. Um, so I think maybe we'll hang tight for that, that poll to be posted here. All right, there you go, you should be seeing it. Um, so just asking folks if you'd like to opt into providing your first name, um, your last name, your email address, job title and organization to our speaker to this event. Um, so please help it, please answer this. It'll also help us um, collect data on uh, attendance for CEU approval. And while folks are answering that poll, uh, I guess I just have one other question for you, Gunnar. Do you ever see these systems uh, constructed as a backup to um, liquid sodium hypochlorite, the 12.5% solutions? Will you see a system like this put in for a backup unit? 
it's it's usually the other way around. Okay. Uh, because, uh -huh. because the capital cost is is significant. That you know why spend that capital for a system that's just going to sit there. Um, so typically, the onsite generator will be the primary, and the bulk will be used as the backup. In that situation, are there issues with the bulk sodium hypochlorite uh, having a shelf life and having to maybe dispose, get rid of that on a periodic basis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I showed everybody that dilution panel that can, uh, in, in a catastrophic event, you can uh, bring in the bulk and, and dilute it down to the 0.8. But uh, it's kind of a belt and suspenders approach. But to be quite honest with you, it's a, it's a very rare event. Um, because with the appropriate shelf spares um, and the support of the manufacturer, it's rare for the generators to be out of service longer than what you have in storage. Because the, the design criteria is to always have uh, at least 48 hours worth of hypochlorite storage in your tanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a little bit to the sizing of the units also for, yeah. um, for the facilities. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, getting a couple other questions coming through here. Um, so one, do we need to send our name in as part of the poll to receive CEUs and TDHs? I believe no, I believe if you answer the poll, um, our moderator should be able to see uh, the names of the folks that did answer. I will say um, for, looks like there's an individual, at least one individual online or one or two that are calling in from a landline. I see a, a 360 number. Please email um, the moderator, the folks uh, who should have emailed an invite to the presentation and or myself. My contact information is on the PNCBOA website. Please let us know you're in attendance um, and you're calling in for the audio so that we can award the CEU. Um, we don't have your name, we just have your phone number. So if you're calling in on the landline for this, please email myself and the moderators and um, we will follow up with CEU information. Um, uh, some. Uh, appreciation here. This is this has been very interesting. I appreciate Gunnar's expertise and his candor. Very well done. You've had a, a high. You set a high bar for other lunch and learn presentations. So appreciate that um, live feedback there. You got to be as old as me and do it as often. <laughs> well practiced. It sounds like. Um, okay, um, I think. Oh, please go ahead, Gunnar. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, if if you're trying to stretch it to the hour, I can I can just offer some some tidbits um, that if you're looking to size a system or curious as to what your um, pound per day requirements are, there's a very simple formula that I use trying to figure out to, you know, how to size a generator. And it's very simple. Your, your flow rate in gallons per minute times your dose rate times a multiplier of 0.5 zero one two will equal your pounds per day of chlorine needed. And then um, 15 gallons of 0.8% solution is equal to one pound of free available chlorine. And um, one gallon of volume will hold 10 pounds of salt. So if you're going to size your salt tank, you know, how many fill cycles are acceptable? How much salt do I need to store? Things like that. Yeah. And then a common question I get and I did not get today when I was showing <clears throat> the uh, cell being removed from, from the skid, uh, I'm often asked if that is the, only the first position can be removed. And the answer is no, it can be any position can be removed and continue to operate the generator. All right. Good additional information there, Gunnar. Thank you. Um, one other follow up question uh, more for PNCW here uh, whether the presentations can be downloaded for future review. I don't know if they'll be downloaded. Um, again, they will be posted to the PNCW website and should be accessible um, at any time. Granted, that may require an internet connection um, to stream them live. I believe they're posted to like a YouTube or an equivalent service, and that's what's linked to the PNCWA site. So um, I can't promise that they will be downloaded, but they will be accessible if you have a live internet connection. Um, 
moving and forward. Uh, feel free to share my contact information, my phone number, as well as my email address. And okay. uh, I'm happy to uh, give this presentation directly to any utility if they're interested in, in, uh, in the presentation and expanding on the discussion. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I think we're, we're at two o'clock here uh, Pacific time. And I think we'll close it out. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Quick note, we do have another upcoming presentation on March 17th and then one following on March 31st. So I'll look at the PNCW website for more information on those. And we will have subsequent presentations um, in April and then May also. So please look forward and please join us for future presentations. Gunnar, thank you so much for your time today and for- Thank you everybody. All right, cheers, thank you. See ya.